I'd like to welcome everybody to this latest installment of Zoom with COA. This is Alan Jay, Director of Outreach and Engagement here at the COA. Um, you're logging into the latest installment. We ask that you please keep your microphones on mute for the duration of the call. Question and answer at the end of the program will be facilitated via the Zoom chat feature, which you'll find in the middle of your screen. Please leave the content of your chat pertinent to today's uh, webinar, which is um, Sovereignty Now event with the leaders of Habit Chanusim, which is over a thousand Israeli commanders for Sovereignty Now. One more time, this is Alan J. Acting National Director of Outreach and Engagement. Welcome to our program. We hope you're all safe and healthy. Uh, the ZOA has been uh, established since 1897. We are the leader in pro-Israel and pro-Jewish advocacy through our Center for Law and Justice, our Department of Government Relations, our ZOA campus, and throughout our regional offices. ZOA shares history, facts, truth that clearly demonstrate Israel's right to be and remain a sovereign Jewish state, including Judea and Samaria, with Jerusalem as her undivided capital and with the right to defend herself if and whenever necessary. Tonight you'll be hearing from Brigadier General Amir Avibi and Major General Yitzchak Gershon. The program will be moderated by ZOA National Board Chair Mark Levinson. Mark is the co-chair of the Real Estate Department and chair of the Real Estate Transactions, Transactions Practice Group at the law firm of Sills, Thomas & Gross. Uh, Mark also chairs the firm's Israel Business Practice Group. Mark is a member of the United States Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad, appointed by President Donald Trump. He's also the chairman of the New Jersey Israel Commission, which is appointed by the governor of New Jersey. Most important to us here is that Mark is the national board chair of the Zionist Organization of America. Um, most recently, Mark had great success leading the, you, the ZOA coalition to our most successful WZC election in our history. And now together with ZOA President Mark Klein, Mark is taking the lead position in ZOA's Sovereignty Now campaign. I turn the program over to you, Mark. Have a good program. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. I want to thank Alan and also Natalie Lazaroff for helping with uh, the organizational elements of this Zoom program. This is another one of our continuing series of Zoom presentations. We're very excited about it. Hopefully the pandemic will be coming to at least, uh, if not an end, it will come into a more uh, 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 normal phase for folks trying to get to work, et cetera. And I hope everyone is as healthy under the circumstances as can be. Uh, I'm very, very excited about this program we're having today for lots of reasons. Uh, and Natalie, if I could just ask you to queue up uh, the billboards. So the Sovereignty Campaign um, movement, uh, which is, certainly has very significant adherence in, uh, in Israel, uh, certainly a lot of folks in Yehuda and Shomron. Uh, it's really a, a campaign that ZOA has grabbed onto with both hands over the last month or so, led by our beloved and important uh, leader, National President Mort Klein. Uh, we have really pushed for the sovereignty campaign because we are facing many, many folks, not only uh, outside of Israel, not only outside of uh, the organized Jewish community, but even frankly within the organized Jewish community, there are many organizations and others who uh, take a different view than we do on the sovereignty campaign. We believe this is a major, major initiative that will help secure not only Israel's security, but will also help very significantly in stabilizing lives for 500,000 uh, Israeli uh, individuals, Jewish Israeli individuals that are living in Yehuda, Shomron, the Jordan Valley, and Yerushalayim. And let's not us forget that 500,000 uh, individuals is probably around 4% of world Jewry. So we're very excited about our campaign. Uh, at any point during this, if we can get the two billboards up, and in addition to the two billboards, uh, which we just, we last Monday, we put up these two billboards at, at a not insignificant cost, but we felt this was very, very instrumental. There are their two billboards. Uh, in English, on the left, this is the way they do advertising and billboards in Israel. It's really a building-wide billboard. On the left, you see our ZOA 
uh, signed Zionist Organization of America, Sovereignty Now, America Stands with Israel at this historic moment. And we have pictures, of course, of Ben-Gurion, Herzl, Begin, and Bibi Netanyahu. And on the right, uh, sovereignty is spelled with a few less letters, Birrit, Ribonot, Achshav, Sovereignty Now, and uh, it's Unai America, Zionist Organization America, uh, Omdim Tzad, Litzad Yisrael, stands by the side of Israel uh, in this very, very uh, important uh, uh, campaign. So uh, that is our two billboards. And if we could, Natalie, uh, if we could put up our 13 points, uh, most of you, if not all of you, should have received uh, our, our press release. We had our 13 short points in sovereignty, why ZOA believes the sovereignty should move forward. And those 13 points were sent out with a paragraph or two for each point, really relatively short. And in, in the embedded in the end, we have a link. We have a very significant uh, detailed backup material and presentation, which of course I wanna thank ZOA's director of special projects, Liz Burney, who took a very significant hand. This is a 13 points and it's critical. As you listen to our speakers today, they're doing their part besides their 20 or 30 years service in the IDF. They're doing their part by spending a significant amount of time on this campaign, which of course you'll hear about and the reasons why. But these are ZOA's 13 reasons why. There are more reasons than this, but you know, we can only go so far in terms of trying to get people's attention. So these are the critical 13 reasons we believe that Israel should have the right to restore her rightful sovereignty over Yehuda Shomron and the Jordanian Valley. And I'm not gonna go through them all, you see them. And again, uh, if you have not received them, please send Alan Jane, Natalie Lazaroff, and myself a note and we'll get it to you. And I'd also like to, if we could, try to get the link to um, uh, the terrific position paper that gives significant detailed information on that. If we're not able to get that up now, we will get it up to you by the end of the program. But it's important you be able to, when you're quoted, when you speak, when you speak to friends, when you write letters, when you do emails, you really need to be able to have a couple of these points with you because the other side just makes up stuff out of whole cloth in this. Uh, not, not everyone and not all the time, but we really face a battle of getting the truth across. People are entitled to disagree with us for sure. That's the First Amendment right in the U.S. It's also the same right in Israel. People are absolutely entitled to disagree with our point of view. But we'd like to have civil conversations on this, and we'd like our positions, which we believe are fact-based and have support. We'd like people to have those conversations with us and, and, and really at least try to absorb and understand our point of view. And hopefully there will be many that will be persuaded. If not persuaded, then maybe at least some of the rhetoric and temperature will be uh, tamped down. Because right now what's out there in this issue is just not, not really accurate. So let me move to why you're all here today. Uh, this is a terrific group, Habit Onim, the Protectors of Israel movement of over 1,000, 1,000 IDF commanders who promote the, fa the fact that sovereignty now is essential for Israel's security. So people do not understand that security is, besides our biblical right, besides the legal right, fundamentally the key issue, or certainly one of the key issues, is protecting Israel's security and sovereignty. And as you know from seeing previous issues, whether it's Iran or sovereignty or Golan, there'll always be trotted out a few folks uh, from, from the Israeli military establishment, usually retired folks, who will give their opinion on why Israel doesn't have to do what you know ZOA and others may be suggesting. And the same thing is occurring here. So that's why it's important that we have this organization of a thousand IDF commanders. This is really, really, very critical, very, very critical that, that this be communicated to you and everyone and people understand these thousand courageous IDF individuals are there. So we have two of them with us today, okay. Habiz Donim, uh, founder and CEO, Brigadier General Amir Avivi and Major General Reserve Yitzchak Jerry Gershon. We will have uh, Brigadier General Amir Avivi speak first. He is Habiz Donim's uh, CEO. He was the head of the Israeli Defense Establishment's Auditing and Consulting Department. He was a commander in Israel's Corps of Combat Engineers, leading thousands of soldiers in a dynamic combat environment. 
He was a brigade commander. He was a deputy division commander and head of the military school of engineers. And he was the aide de camp for the chief of the general staff of the IDF. At the time, Lieutenant General Moshe Bogi Alon, with General Avivi, was at the heart of the policy making process in the Israeli government and the defense establishment. He was a founder of Habiton Istim, which I'm not pronouncing fully correctly, around uh, uh, February, I think he started. He's spending most of his time in this. He also was involved with a startup called 10, 10 Dimensions, I believe. But he really is here in the capacity to talk to us about this wonderful organization. The second speaker that will follow um, Amir is Major General uh, Jerry Gershon. He's a leading Habiston Istim member. He's had over 32 years of distinguished IDF military experience. He commanded top IDF combat units, coordinated numerous special operations, led the Home Front Command, and served as commander of the ID, IDF Judea and Samaria Yehud and Shomron Division. Much of his service was on the front lines in Lebanon and Yehud and Shomron. He also served as the friend of IDF's FIDF CEO, and he's doing a bunch of other things now and obviously spends a lot of his time in this organization. I just want to mention that today is Monday. I personally am very proud on a personal basis that on Wednesday by Zoom, because of the coronavirus, I'll be seeing my one of my nephews, one of my, I think it's 25 now, nephew's nieces, nephew who is being promoted to lieutenant in his ceremony, which we'll all be seeing uh, by Zoom uh, in, in Israel this Wednesday, those of his relatives and friends will be attending. So really with that as a backdrop, we're so proud of the work you're doing. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, Amir. He combined, he and Jerry will speak for around 30 minutes and then uh, uh, we'll go to Q and A's. If you have Q and A's, send them in. Uh, we have some in advance and we'll hope to end the program if not at one o'clock by 102 or 105, okay? Take it away, gentlemen. So proud and pleased to have you here with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here with you. Good evening from Israel, specifically me from Caesarea. Uh, I, I think that talking to the Zionist Organization of America and uh, being able to bring new notions or ideas about sovereignty will be hard. You are deep into the issue. And I've read your papers and they're excellent. And um, today, unfortunately, calling yourself a Zionist organization, it's not something that is clear. People stop talk, talking about Zionism. And, and this is part of the reason why we, we established the Bitcoinist team. In the last 10 years, 15 years, I was uh, deeply frustrated uh, by seeing more and more uh, retired generals talking about uh, retreats, about ceding land to enemies who don't seem at all to have any interest to actually make peace with us, uh, but on the, on the contrary, want to annihilate us. And uh, no matter what happens on the ground, you will see terror attacks, Gaza, that became Hamas land, ISIS everywhere. People still talk, still talk about retreats and about the, the notion that if you sign a peace agreement, you are able to give Israel security to somebody else's hands. And this is was the idea pushed very, very strongly by the Obama administration. During that time, uh, an organization called CIS, Commanders for Israel Security, was established, and they basically pushed forward uh, Obama's ideas. And these ideas, uh, we all agree in the Bitchonisti movement, endanger Israel existentially. The idea that you can retreat to the Green Line, to uh, the 49 Armitage Line, seed all of the, we the West Bank, seed uh, the Jordan Valley, and in the long term, have Palestinians, Jordanians, the UN, the US, uh, anyone but, but Israel uh, taking care of Israel's security is uh, the perfect formula to destroy Israel. And, and, and it worries me that there are so many high ranking officers that are willing to push forward such an idea. 
And we felt that most of the officers in Israel, the brigade commanders, the battalion commanders, and many of the warriors, they think differently, but they didn't have any organization uh, that can enable them to express their views. And we felt that we need to do two things. We need to talk about national security in the long term and educate the Israeli public, educate also uh, the decision makers in Israel and also abroad about what are these, uh, the security needs of Israel in the long term. But we also felt that we need to do it from a Zionistic perspective because it uh, seems to me that people have almost, they almost stop talking about Zionism. So stop talking about why we are here. Why did we come back to the land of Israel? What does the, the different places in Judea and Samaria mean to us? Shiloh, Betel, the Marat HaMachpelah, the cave of our forefathers. And, and we felt it's time to proudly talk again about Zionism and talk about Israel's need. And we established uh, the movement uh, in February. We started working uh, in January. Uh, and and it, it, it was very uh, lucky that at that time in Israel and in the States, uh, everybody started talking about sovereignty. And uh, this uh, really helped bringing many officers on board. I mean, think about it, it's amazing. We, we exist only five months. And in five months, without us reaching to anybody, we didn't do any promotion, nothing. A thousand officers and commanders and warriors joins the organization and the organization is, is growing every day, very, very uh, fast. People are very excited to hear commanders doing the, nothing special really, just talking Zionism and uh, talking about Israel's uh, security needs, but in a way that is professional and in a way that is uh, unapologetic. And, and I think this is, means a lot to many people in Israel. People at the end of the day, they look up to their commanders and, and they want to hear them leading and they want to hear them uh, talking Zionism. And they want to know that they put Israel's needs and interests and security first and foremost, and not, not things that uh, Israel, Israel's well-being is dependent on what will happen with the Palestinians or anybody else. I was also very worried, uh, and I talked about it at the beginning, that, about the idea that people think after we were in the Holocaust and survived so many atrocities uh, throughout these 2,000 years of exile, that anybody only after 72 years can, can think about ideas like placing Israel's security in uh, Arab, Arab hands. It's amazing that people can think uh, this way. And we, we decided that we are going to deal with this and, and we're going to talk to the general public in a way that the public can understand. Because they, what uh, many people do, they uh, talk to the public with different phrases and uh, ways of talking that seem like they care about security, but actually they're pushing ideas that mean that they're going to sit our security. Now, when we talk about sovereignty or any, any idea, the, the, the first thing that we have to ask ourselves, okay, so what is the alternative? If you want to support or not support sovereignty, you have to understand what is the alternative to sovereignty. And basically, there are two uh, basic possibilities. I would like to share a map and I think it will help uh, understanding it uh, better. Can we get that map up? Okay, good. Yeah, good. you can see good, it. Good, 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 there it is. Okay, basically, you know, this people have a lot of ideas I, I about... Uh, I, I'm there. I must tell you, this not only is terrific on first glance, but, you know, the 8.7 is even so much more critical because even though nine's not that much more, I mean, 8.7 is even less. We should all use that instead of nine. Thank you. Yeah. 
you know, I, 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 when, when I talk to audiences in the States, I, I tell them many times that I tend to jog nine miles in the morning, thinking about jogging your own state. Right. Just in the morning, it's a bit uh, frightening to think like this. But anyway, it does, people have a lot of ideas how to deal with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but at the end of the day, there are really only two basic uh, situations. One is pushed by the left in Israel, and it's called the separation plan. The idea in the separation, separation plan is based on the fact that in Judea and Samaria, there are around, let's say, 2 million Palestinians which are under Palestinian authority. Some people they say there is less, a million and a half. Some people say there are more. It doesn't really matter. Let's say between a million and a half to two, two and a half. And, and, and they are under the Palestinian authority, most of them. Then they, are, they have Palestinian uh, citizenship. And the separation plan says that if we want to completely separate from these Palestinians, we have to withdraw all the way to the 49 Armitage line, which is uh, this line, this uh, line that is 8.7 miles or nine miles from uh, uh, Netanya. And then things lo would look simple. We are on one side of, uh, uh, of the border. They are on the other side of the border. But then there is one uh, big issue. We, are, we have to see uh, the Jordan uh, Valley, which means we are connecting the heart of Israel, Judea and Samaria, with all the Middle East, enabling millions of people to either immigrate, uh, bring weapons, uh, terrorists, jihadists, or whatever inside this area. And the other thing is that since the, these are high mountains and they completely overlook the shallow areas of uh, Tel Aviv, it will make, of course, a, a, a huge, huge problem, uh, or it's impossible actually to secure such a situation. So how do they sell it to Israelis? They do something very simple. They say, no, no, listen, guys, everything will be fine. We will, the, the IDF will remain in the Jordan River for 10 or 15 years and there will be military control without the population. And then you say to yourself, okay, and what exactly is supposed to happen in 10 or 15 years? Well, I would say it bluntly, who cares? It's 15 <coughs> years, who knows? You know, it reminds me, it reminds me, it's exactly the idea of the agreements signed by Obama with the Iranians. Let's postpone the inevitable. Let's sign an agreement that says that for 15 years, the Iranians cannot have nuclear weapons. And what will happen after 15 years? You know, it's not, it won't be his administration, so who cares? And, 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 and the notion that you just, um, you know, push it, the problem into the future and let the next generation deal with uh, basically annihilation or a situation that is very bad or impossible. It, it's something that is unacceptable. And, and, and there is no solution. You cannot have an army situated in a place where you don't have towns where you don't have sovereignty. And so this is the separation plan. And the way I see it, and I'm sure Jerry will agree, if this happens, Israel will face for sure 100% an existential threat in the future. So this is not an option at all. The other option is that this entity, whatever you call it, a Palestinian entity will be surrounded by Israel. Israel will have full control of the Jordan Valley and the high uh, mountain area and will have full freedom of operation anywhere 
in Judea and Samaria because this is the two basic needs. You have to be able to separate everything that is going on in the Middle East from entering into the heart of Israel. And you also have to make sure that any terrorist that tries to start building mortars, anti-tank missiles, or just thinks about carrying a terrorist attack, we're able to foil this attack as we do today by uh, operating freely in these places. Now, there is no freedom of operation without Jewish towns along the roads. What enables I the IDF to move freely and fast from one place to the other is the civilian society, is the fact that every day we have tens of thousands of cars moving around the, the main roads of Judea and Samaria. People go to work, go back home, go shopping, go to malls and so on. And they're actually enabling uh, the freedom of operation of the IDF without towns. This is a whole different scenario. How different? We see down here Gaza. We retreated from Gaza. If we want to apprehend one single terrorist inside Gaza, we need a full scale war. In Judea and Samaria, if we want to apprehend the terrorist, we send two vehicles with maybe 10 soldiers or even less, and they go and apprehend him. This is the difference. This is how Gaza looks after retreats. And this is a very shallow area. It's a very small area. It's nothing like the mountains of Judea and Samaria where we, the Jewish people, defeated empires 2,000 years ago. It's, Judea and Samaria is, 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 is a whole different issue. And there is no existence for the Jewish people without full control of this area. So we talked about two possibilities. One is separation, which is basically not relevant at all. And the other one is, uh, is sovereignty. Now, if you understand there are, that there are no two options, there is only one option and, and we need this sovereignty and we need it for the long term, then anybody with minimum common sense has to understand that when the stars are aligned and we have this moment, we have this opportunity for a whole range of reasons, because it's the specific American administration, because of Corona, because the Middle East has completely collapsed, and, 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 and because the Arabs want to get closer to Israel, because they're afraid from the Iranians, for so many reasons. There is one moment in history when we can actually do this. We have to seize the moment and do it, because we have to look a thousand years ahead not what will happen tomorrow morning. It doesn't matter what will happen. And, and sure, maybe the Palestinians will get a bit mad and maybe the Jordanian uh, king will uh, call back his uh, ambassador for two months, who knows? But it's a non-issue when you look at the well-being of the Jewish people for the next thousand years. I always say that when we talk about the Jewish people who exist 4,000 years, a nation that exists 4,000 years must be able to look at least 1,000 years ahead. So people talk about tactics, what will happen tomorrow morning, and uh, why should we do this now? And because there is corona now, it's not a good idea. And they don't have the vision. They don't have the long-term vision of what's the right thing to do in the long term. And this is what we, the Bitchonistic movement, are bringing to the table. And we met with Prime Minister Netanyahu. We, we also uh, sent a letter to President Trump supporting this. And, and I think this is a time for leadership. This is a time for people who can see for the long term and not be afraid and, uh, of what will happen tomorrow morning. And certainly it's a, it's a time to bring Zionism and our uh, self-respect and dignity uh, to the center of attention and not try to build our future uh, based on what's good for the Palestinians. I think there are enough solutions for the Palestinians. 
By the way, nobody is talking in this scenario about uh, applying sovereignty over the Palestinians. There will be, they'll continue uh, ruling themselves. So there is no danger to the majority of the Jewish people uh, in Israel. And you know, people, I, I saw that one of the things you wrote, you are opposing a state. Um, and remember, the Vatican is a state. The Vatican is a state uh, the size of, uh, of a neighborhood inside, inside the capital of another state with no airspace, with no army, but they are a state. So basically, I would conclude uh, by saying that Israel's security needs are rigid. You cannot play around with them while a statecraft is very, very, very flexible. There are a lot of solutions for the Palestinians that maybe we'll have a different uh, session in the future talking about how to solve the Palestinians issue. But we are here first of all to talk what are the interests of Israel and what do we need? Because on the other side at the moment, we don't have really a partner to talk to. And in this sense, uh, uh, we support fully uh, sovereignty and we, we expect both the administration and Prime Minister Netanyahu to apply sovereignty over the full 30% and not a 1% one, 1 less. Uh, I think it's better to do it at once and not try to cut it into pieces and then you don't know what will happen. So saying that I would um, pass the... Uh, oh. Okay, we'll make thank, the general, uh, thank you very much. That was terrific, and, and thank you. Uh, Jerry, General, can you pick it up now? Do we have him on mute? The, the microphone, Jerry. No, it's closed again. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah we hear you fine. We hear you fine. Yeah. Welcome, thank you. I don't know if you were on at the very beginning. We're not going to go over your terrific bio. And we're no, not no, no. The, the, oh, you were. Okay, good. Take it that's away. Fi that that's fine. That's fine. I I was from the very beginning. Uh, I heard your uh, all introduction, and uh, I heard my friend, my colleague uh, Amir, which we served together for uh, many years in the in the IDF. And um, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for having us. I think we have a common goal uh, to ensure the security of the state of Israel uh, for generations to come. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity uh, to talk about the, uh, let's say, US president's uh, plan uh, even though we are uh, facing um, the COVID-19 worldwide uh, and the economic crisis all over, uh, which sometimes uh, people say, uh, why do you need to deal with, with the, uh, this plan uh, right now? There are so many, uh, you know, uh, challenges that we, uh, that we need to face. And uh, we, we take an example uh, from our first prime minister and our first uh, uh, minister of defense, uh, David Ben-Gurion, that uh, once somebody uh, came to him and said, you know, we cannot bring now the uh, the Jewish community from Iraq. Uh, and he said, why? Uh, and the answer was, uh, we, have a, we have problems, we don't have work, uh, the economy is in crisis, uh, we don't have houses, and so on. Uh, it was a very tough time in, in 1947, 1948, and he said, bring them, bring all of them immediately. Um, why I use this example, because my parents came uh, with, with this community uh, in 1948. Uh, so I can present you today 
why, why we need to do this plan, even though we are facing so many, uh, so many challenges. Uh, I don't want to repeat my friend, but I, I would like to say to you that one can say that peace is the best platform um, for security. I, I can agree, but you need to understand in which world are you living in, in which area, in which region we are living in. Uh, you, you cannot take anything for granted and you cannot trust any paper uh, that any leaders in the Middle East sign. Uh, and and uh, we, we have two peace agreement with, uh, with, with Egypt and with Jordan. This is a strategic asset for Israel, as well as strategic asset for uh, these uh, countries. So what is new? In this, uh, in, this, uh, in this plan. Uh, first of all, we think that this uh, plan that, uh, let's say the White House uh, team worked on uh, with people all over the Middle East and especially in Israel, uh, is the first time that Israel narratives uh, puts on the table. This is the first time. Uh, and this is a game changer because our strategic interest is on the table. And if we don't put them on the table, uh, we can assure that the conflict will go on forever, forever. Now, what is this interest? Not just historical, historic interest, by but security interest first and foremost. And if we talk about the Jordan Valley, it, it's written in the Bible. You don't, need to, you don't need to be a military expert. And uh, I can tell you that in March 27, 1949, one of our strategic leaders, one of the best leaders, Yigal Alon, wrote a letter to Ben-Gurion, to the first prime minister. He said, we need to continue and uh, conquer the mountains because if we, if we won't be there, uh, we will be always in risk and wars. No way to achieve peace if we are not uh, controlling the, uh, uh, the, uh, the mountain. This plan is really uh, uh, realize the facts on the ground, the reality on the ground from both sides. Uh, it says, uh, we understand that Judea and Samaria is very important for uh, the Jewish people, but we realize that 2 million Palestinians are living there. So we gave a solution to that by the Oslo Agreement, 95-97% uh, of the, the, the uh, indigenous in, in Judea and Samaria, the Palestinians, are living in A and B territory. Why, why C left uh, to the negotiation? And this is what our uh, prime minister at that time, Itzhak Rabin, said that, first of all, let's see if we can make a peace. And what we have uh, experienced is just wars. I was the head of Judea and Samaria during the second intifada. I can, tell, I can tell you that the name intifada is a wrong name. It was a well-organized campaign by the Palestinian Authority against Israeli citizens. We, have, we had like 1,200 Israelis have been killed by this intifada that well-organized by the chairman of the Palestinian Authority. No, no, no other person. And if you see the, the Gaza Strip, you understand that we, you, you cannot trust anyone but yourself. So this plan is first time uh, puts on the table the strategic interest of the state of Israel. Um, secondly, it says to the Palestinians that we will not uh, wait for them forever. 
uh, we can shape the borders of the state of Israel, we can start, build, develop uh, this uh, area that we think belongs to us. And, and uh, Amir, my friend, said, there is no security without settlements, without cities uh, in the Bika Valley. It's not the security zone in Lebanon. We, ha we have interest to contain any threat within or between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. We, and, and this is something that this plan brings to the table, that the security, no matter what, the, the last uh, agreement, uh, what kind of agreement will be signed with the Palestinians, the security between the Jordan Valley and the Mediterranean Sea will stay forever in the hands of the Israeli security services land, air, and sea. Uh, and this, this, this is not unit, unilateral uh, plan. Uh, we, we ask, or the, the US presidents ask the Palestinians to come to the table. We, can, we want to negotiate uh, the, uh, uh, this, this plan. And they said, first of all, they said no, as always, but Something very, like very, I'm very bother me that every time they say they say no to any plan, they add, we will uh, get into a violent, we will get into a, a war against this plan. No, let's talk. If it was a peace between Sweden and uh, I don't know Switzerland or and uh, Austria or. Uh, uh, this is what you say to a peace plan, to come to the table and say, yes, but I want to ensure my interest. This is fine. But they don't say that. They say, if you don't, if you don't agree with us, with our, with our narrative, with our interest, we will open an intif an, a third intifada. So what? They can, they can open third intifada. It's, it's good for us to pay the price in the short term in order to ensure the long term, as, as Amir said. We, we would like to build something for the next thousand years, not for the next five years. Thank and, you, Jerry. We are going to let people uh, ask, ask questions. Just, to give just, them just, no, just, just, let, just let, him, uh, let Jerry take another couple minutes and then uh, I have a whole no, no, I'm, 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 I, this is, this is the This is the end. Uh, I just want you to know that the plan, um, the, the plan says to the Palestinian that if they want to start any negotiation, they must stop the incitement, they must stop paying uh, terrorist families, they need to dismantle uh, the, the Islamic Jihad and Hamas, and uh, and people say, hey, what's uh, even even in Israel they are against the plan. Why? Because maybe there will be uh, a, a Palestinian state. Well, I don't think that the Palestinians can uh, really stand behind uh, these challenges. And uh, in Israel, you see other group of generals. They are my friend. I like them. They are my brother. We serve together. They say, you know what? Let's do the plan, but in consent with Jordan, with the Palestinian, with, this is a time for leadership. There is no consent regarding land in the Middle East. No, no consent whatsoever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna go to uh, questions. I have a very significant number in the queue here. Natalie, if there's any way, if we can get up the link, a number of people have sent, uh, I mean, chats, send us all chats. If we get a link up to the position paper, we put I'll up- I posted it in the chat, but I'll post it again. Okay, good, great. Because uh, if you go on there, not only you see the 13 points, but again, special thanks to Liz Burney, who did a terrific job and really helping significantly on this terrific position paper, which will give you all the information you need. Okay, just before we go to uh, our uh, uh, questions, I just want to let everyone know 
that we have over 130 people on this. And in general, in general, I just want to let you know that normally people drop off. We have the same number right now at the end as we had in the beginning. We may even have a couple more. So Yashikoa. I also, I also get in trouble if I ever mentioned anyone specific. But I must tell you, I'm sitting here in New Jersey doing this Zoom before I go back into my office. And, 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 and one of New Jersey's finest, who lives uh, I live in Israel now, uh, from Trenton, New Jersey, one of Trenton, New Jersey's all-time great citizens, who is really a hero of us who are sports fans. Tal Brody is sitting here watching. So uh, he's with us, and he's waving for those of you who you can see. And, you know, again, it's, uh, you, can be a, you can be a soldier for Israel in many ways. You can be a hero for Israel in many ways. So Kolakovo to you guys, Kolakovo to Tal Brody, and I say Kolakovo to ZOA. Thank you all for being here. Let's go into some of the questions. A number of the questions go across the same themes. Okay, first one. Uh, well, what about all these Jewish organizations that are against sovereignty? You know, a number of people have said, who are they? Well, frankly, it's easy to tell you who's for sovereignty. ZOA, Young Israel came out the other day. Young Israel came out with a, a, a st nice statement the other day. Americans for, for Safe Israel, they came out. But I don't want to leave anyone out, but I don't know if I get much further than those three that I mentioned. So I don't need to go through the laundry list of the major Jewish organizations that either are neutral or unfortunately are significantly against us on this issue. So um, if you're involved in wearing your other hats, folks in this call, if you're involved in any of those other groups, call them, send them our links. I assure you most of them have received uh, the link from us anyway, but please, you should let them know how you feel. It is very disappointing on that front. Next question. A lot of questions came in about um, uh, General Benny, Benny Gantz and his position and what does that do? And we all read the papers, uh, the Prime Minister, Bibi Netanyahu, clearly wants to do all of the, uh, the major settlement uh, uh, areas, uh, Gush Etzion, uh, Malaya Dumim, uh, the Jordan Valley. Uh, 500,000 Israelis are living there. Can you, generals, can you talk to us and tell us what you think uh, General Gantz's position is? I mean, we read his position, but what do you think his position is and what do you think his end game is? And what do you think he really would like to accomplish? Jerry? Um, so, uh, I've served with uh, General Gantz in the uh, Paratrooper Brigade. Uh, we were together battalion commanders. And uh, I know him for uh, many years. Actually, I uh, succeeded him in Judea, in uh, Samaria, uh, during the Second Intifada. And uh, I would like to answer this question in a different way. Please. I, I, I do think that I'm, I'm doubting if the, 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 the would be a timing where the U.S. president and the prime minister of Israel are seeing first thing to, together uh, the, the same the same the same thing like I don't see any other leader in Israel today in the coalition that can go for such a plan and uh, this is why we need uh, really to move forward because I don't know what's going to happen in the election in the United States I don't know what's going to happen here in Israel this is a unique time we need to take advantage on, on that uh, because I don't build on, on Benjamin Gantz uh, to lead uh, such a plan because he said, uh, yes, I'm a, I agree, but in consent with Jordan, in consent with the Palestinians, uh, guys, leadership is, is all about dilemma, is all about complexity, um, it's not about uh, easy life. You know, you have uh, black and white, you have, today you cannot say that, but uh, you, you have right and wrong uh, leadership in our imperfect world is to take decisions, hard decisions against 
uh, against and for um, against others and for your uh, your interest so I, I, I wouldn't uh, wait because if things would change uh, in America and in Israel um, we will be in Israel will be in a very bad situation. Okay, Amir, do you want to comment? No, let's go to the other question. Maybe okay, let me just say I, 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 am, I am very happy to correct myself. I forgot that JINSA, the great organization JINSA also is solidly behind this as well. And so, uh, and if there are other corrections, please folks let me know. Okay, there are a number of questions that go to this issue. Some of these things you've kind of touched upon but a, a lot, many people are under the misapprehension that Israel is gonna to have to take care of two million Palestinians. Some people have said two five, some people have said two seven, others of us think it may be a million and a half, a million three, but whatever the number is, uh, explain to the folks on, on this Zoom how it's not true that Israel would have to take care of whatever million and a half, two million Palestinians under the sovereignty plan. Okay, I think there is no bigger misconception and maybe not bigger lie than saying that if we apply sovereignty over areas that are not under the Palestinian Authority control, but are areas that under, are under Israeli control and Israeli population, if we apply our laws on the Israeli population, this would mean supposedly that we are uh, annexing two million Palestinians. It's simply not true. It's not true. The Palestinians are going to continue to govern themselves. And we don't see any scenario where Israel has an interest to conquer back all of uh, the Palestinian Authority and govern instead of them. And, and, and I think that Trump's plan in many ways is the proof that also the American administration can come up with a plan that I'm sure that many international ex law experts check that says that there can be a Palestinian state that is based on Gaza and parts of Judea and Samaria and maybe even a connection between them. And yes, it's not a state like uh, the USA or maybe England or I don't know. It's something in between Luxembourg and uh, you know, a normal state, but it's a state, it's a state and, and we're not annexing any Palestinians at all. I mean, in, in this specific plan, we're talking maybe about applying sovereignty over 6,000 Palestinians in a small town in the Jordan Valley called Uja. That's it. And if we do so, these 6,000 Palestinians will receive Israeli citizenship. If they want to. If they don't, they won't. But they will be offered. So we're not uh, annexing any Palestinians, not now and not in the future. And I think we do have to have a serious talk in the long term, how we ensure that also in 200 years, when we, we won't uh, have to deal with such an uh, issue. And there are solutions. I saw people writing here, ah, there, maybe Jordan in the future will be the Palestinian state. I myself uh, have been promoting uh, for the last three years a plan that also General uh, Gershon supports called the New State Solution, which anchors a Palestinian state in Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula. So there are solutions, but we all, we all have to, we have to realize, all of us, that in Judea and Samaria, there will be a Palestinian entity surrounded by Israel with no airspace and with full security responsibility of Israel. And, and this is reality. Now, after we realize that and we apply sovereignty, there are solutions for this issue. Okay, thank you. I want to just let everyone know it's 1257. We are going to go to 105 with questions, 105, 106, and we'll have a ZOA close. 
and you'll be off by you know 109, 110. So people are trying to understand time-wise where we're going. So um, thank you on that. Let me ask you another question. Uh, this comes from Len Getz. The previous questions had multiple parties asking it, so I didn't want to pick one name or the other. I think Len is the only one asking this one. Uh, Len says, we are reading, which we all know, we are reading that sovereignty is not starting on July 1 as promised. Um, and there were many stories in that today. What is your view, either you or me or, or Jerry, we can go back and forth here. What's your current progress on the timeline and when the prime minister will actually move forward on this? Mark, this is Alan. Could you try and fix your camera, please? Yeah. Jerry? Uh, actually, nobody uh, nobody knows, and it's uh, and and it's good that way. Uh, the prime minister uh, hold the, the cards, uh, and he 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 didn't share uh, the the deepest detail of the plan, uh, not with the chief of staff, not with the uh, with his ministers, and uh, no one really knows what's going to happen. Um, you know, uh, politic is uh, it's a it's an unknown world. Uh, there are so many difficulties, and uh, we have uh, inside like we have difficulties inside the government regarding the plan. Um, and this is something that I'm I'm ashamed to uh, to share with you that uh, uh, leaders uh, talking directly with the uh, uh, with the White House on a different way, on a different interest, and things so, and 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 so so forth, and 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 this is like a a, a problem, but uh, we don't have any other choice but uh, to trust uh, that Netanyahu will uh, will do the right thing on the right time. Thank you. Okay, here's a great question. Uh, from uh, Gene Friedberg. I don't think you can actually do this today, but hopefully if you can get us the material, we'll send it out to everyone. Gene says, can Amir show us a map with boundaries that would fulfill Israel's security requirements? So I don't know if you have that and you can put it up on, on the screen with this short notice. Uh, if you don't, if you can get us that, we'll circulate it to everyone. Okay, uh, another, what? Let, me see, let me see what Amir's doing. Okay, Amir, show us. I mean, this was you, okay. You would basically, basically, um, in order to ensure Israel's security, you need first of all to have all this area here, which is the Jordan Valley, as Rabin said, in its most broader sense. It means not only the valley, which we see here, but also the the mountains that control the valley. So. This is one thing that Israel has to apply its sovereignty over with the towns and everything. The other thing is the main, the main roads, the, the main blocks and the main roads. So basically, for example, you have Route 60 that crosses Judean Samaria from south to north. You have Route 5, Route 1, and so on that cross from west to east. And there is no way to control uh, to dance Samaria without, without controlling these roads. And it comes as no surprise that most of the Jewish towns are along these roads. Now, people tend to talk a lot about blocks. The block is not the real issue. Having a block here in Gush Etzion or uh, somewhere here, this is not what creates security. What creates security is what the left calls the uh, isolated settlements, which are not isolated at all. They are just spread along the main roads, south to north and the uh, west east. And these are actually the important uh, towns that enable Israel to, to the, the IDF to have a freedom of uh, operation. So, the way the towns were built in Judea and Samaria are very clever. Some of them are built in a way that overlooks into the uh, Jordan Valley in this area. And many of them are, are um, built in a way that enables to drive critical roads without seeing any Palestinians. When you drive from Jerusalem 
to the Dead Sea, for example, all the way you see on the left and on the right Jewish, uh, Jewish towns. And this is the way to do it. Uh, and, um, and the basic idea is that in Oslo already, we, we gave the Palestinians the areas that were with massive amount of Arabs. So today 95% of the Palestinians are under the Palestinian Authority control. And this is the best scenario, keeping them in this size and applying sovereignty over everything uh, we can where you don't have uh, many Palestinians. Okay, thank you. So we're really, uh, I'm gonna ask you one more question. Before I ask you that one question, I'll tell you there were another couple of questions that came in on again, what will happen to the Palestinian settlers in, in this area. You already indicated that it's not only not 2 million, it's 6,000 in one village. They would be given the opportunity to have Israeli citizenship because it's such a major misconception and folks have also continued to ask about that. I wanted to put that out here. Our last question comes from Steve Orlo. He says, General Avivi mentioned your group met with the Prime Minister. Um, what was his reaction, especially about the Jordan Valley? Hopefully the answer was yes, but please tell us a little bit about, a few minutes, tell us about the meeting and, and his enthusiasm and, and whatever else you would say. Joe, you want to talk about the meeting? Amir, take, take the... You can okay. do it. You want me to do it? So, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, um, what, what we can tell you is that the Prime Minister is fully, fully um, uh, support and understand the importance of this plan for the security of the, of the State of Israel for generations to come. He understands that uh, this is something that needs to be done. Uh, we need to move uh, forward. Uh, in order to, uh, let's say, uh, concentrate or focus on uh, the internal challenges and not just the external challenges. Uh, he understands that uh, all the noises uh, around us come uh, from interests and uh, he, he doesn't worry about, about it. Uh, we need to do the right thing for the state of Israel, and all the rest will be will be uh, fine. We saw a very ambitious, determined uh, uh, leader that knows exactly what is he doing and why is he doing at that at that at that uh, um, special uh, moment in uh, in history. Okay, thank you. That was terrific. Amir and Jerry. I just want to say that we yes, sat with the please. Prime Minister more, more than an hour. And I think it was one of the most joyful moments he had in the 13 years as Prime Minister. <laughs> because he's surrounded by people who tell him what not to do. And he finally met generals that are determined and said to him, listen, we're with you. Go for it. Do what you have to do. That's terrific. Thank you. Um, like many other folks, ZOA's uh, offices in New York are currently closed. We will uh, be opening at some point in the future, and we really hope that when the pandemic calms down even more and you're in the U.S., we want to have you come speak to our board of directors and contributors in our office in New York. It will be our pleasure. We've got to get your message out. Whatever happens, and we hope it goes the right way in the beginning of July, it still is a message that's going to need to continue. And we hope your thousand, which you put together, thousand commanders since February, we hope it will continue, you know, to 10,000, uh, 20,000, whatever amount we can possibly get. So thank you very much. Can I, I add, can I add something, Mark? Yes, yes please. I, I saw your uh, advertisement uh, in, in many places in Israel. Um, I, I do think um, I do think that if you add our title, the Protectors of Israel, to your uh, advertisement, it would do uh, uh, even a better work on the Israeli p uh, public uh, on the Israeli public. So if you can coordinate these messages yeah, with Amir, on this issue. yeah, we yeah, can collaborate. So 
So we have we our our, our sovereignty uh, uh, campaign steering committee will meet <laughs> tomorrow. I assure you, I will bring that to everyone's attention. And you know, as you know, these build billboards, which are really on buildings, are extremely expensive. So as we figure out what we're doing when it comes up for renewal, it's a terrific idea, and it's a terrific idea generally. So I want to thank you both. We look forward to seeing you when we open up or when we come back to Israel. Speaking thank of you. Israel. ZOA, and please stay on because we're going to want to meet with you when we do get going and we have our, first, our next uh, VIP mission to Israel. Uh, Howard Katzoff, senior staff at ZOA, uh, really has been helping to lead that and coordinate that the last several years. And what's special about the ZOA uh, mission to Israel is we spend significant time in Yehud and Shomro. We meet with a lot of quality politicians, of course. We, we see some nice uh, historical and sightseeing events, but we spend significant time in, in the land of Yehud and Shomron. And we certainly hope that we'll be able to meet with you there uh, if, if we're open to doing this in February, which is when we typically do it. And anyone on this call, if you're interested, just reach out to Howard Katzoff. There's no obligation right now. We know the pandemic's there, but we want to kind of have folks who have an interest to be in touch with Howard so that we have you on our radar screen. I also want to, in closing, besides thanking our terrific uh, speakers today, I want to mention some wonderful upcoming events. We're continuing with all our Zoom programs here. Our next one is Tuesday at 11 uh, a.m., uh, presented by ZOA's Greater Philadelphia Chapter, Philadelphia being the home of Mort Klein, our national president. Uh, the, the topic will be anti-Israel media bias, how to spot it, what you can do about it, and a link will be provided in the chat book uh, in the chat box. I'm hoping it's there showing up now. Wednesday at 1 p.m., ZOA's next book club meeting. I don't know. We're up to 11 or 12 on the book clubs. Book club meeting with Joel Gilbert. Joel will be discussing Shmuel Katz's book, Lone Wolf, a biography of Vladimir Zev Jabotinsky. And again, there should be a link provided in the chat box. I leave that to Alan and Natalie. Uh, finally, we have very exciting, very exciting. On July 7th at 7 p.m., we have famed and uh, constitutional law scholar and Harvard Law School emeritus professor Alan Dershowitz will be speaking about his book, Guilt by Accusation. And there'll be a link in that ch chat box as well. So it's 1.10, folks. I want to thank you all for sticking with us. I again want to thank Natalie and John for helping to get this going. And please, if, you, uh, if what we've done here inspires you, then obviously, especially with the cost of these billboards, you can focus a contribution to our sovereignty campaign. You can focus a contribution to ZOA's general work. But above all, come back, come see our webinars. We need to spread the good work we're doing. Have a great day, everyone. Have a Lila Tov, Arab Tov in Israel to Jerry and Amir. And thank you so much for being with us. Have a good thank day. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. Thank you for inviting us. Our pleasure.